Hello, botany students. I am Professor Frenetovich, and this is our first video lecture. So welcome to class. This is going to be a study of plants, and I hope you enjoy it. I am very passionate about botany, and I hope to share that with you. So I'm going to be giving video lectures during our semester uh, because we have an online lecture, and you will see these as YouTube links, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, so I'll give an overview and then we will get into our class. So for the start of this, we're, I'm gonna touch on chapter one topics. So you should be reading chapter one in the Stearns textbook. I'm gonna go section by section here, but I won't always do lectures in this way. I really like to make it more fluid and organic and talk about the topics that are in the textbook um, in my own way. But I just wanted to start out this way to get you looking at the textbook and see what's there. So this is going to be chapter one, and then we are going to go into chapter 16 with diversity and classification of plants. So I'm kind of jumping one to 16 here. So we're going to, after we look at chapter one, go into the history of plant sciences and then look at diversity and classification of plants. So Plants are an important thing to study. They're an important thing to understand. Life on Earth depends on plants. Early on in the evolution of life on Earth, the first organisms to arise were bacteria. And photosynthetic bacteria played a huge role in increasing the oxygen in the atmosphere of Earth. And so as oxygen increased, um, the, the biosphere, Earth, atmosphere and everything in that realm was able to support different types of life. So those first photosynthetic organisms evolved into different stretches of organisms. We had protists, we had plants, and eventually animals. And so they do play a huge part in environmental processes like putting oxygen in the atmosphere and reducing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plants will take in CO2, carbon dioxide, and give off oxygen. Um, and this gas exchange is extremely important for survival of life and also for mitigating climate change. We also depend on plants for food. They are the primary producers on the planet. They produce um, glucose and sugars and starches from sunlight and carbon dioxide. So extremely important for us for food and for other organisms for food. We also use plants for medicine and medicine derivatives. Um, I'm not just talking about herbal medicine, but many of our modern pharmaceuticals are derived from plants and plant products um, taken into the lab. And the earth um, depends on plants to fill human and animal needs. So other things as well, uh, including habitat. Humans in the environment um, have an interplay with plants that is unique. Humans depend on plants for agriculture, housing, and fuel. So in, in terms of agriculture, I studied agriculture in college. There are many different methods of agriculture that are currently in effect around the world, ranging from biodynamic to conventional, organic to regenerative. So we have lots of different types of agriculture, all working with humans and plants, the soil and animals. So we um, have this tight link with plants in that regard. I mentioned habitat before in the previous slide, but we also require um, housing and many places use wood to build houses and structures. We use plants for fuel, ethanol, biofuels, and ancient fossil fuels, some of which are derived from plant matter. So we, we need plants for many different reasons and it's important to study the plants so that we can maximize what we get from them with doing the minimal amount of harm on our environment. You'll see it in chapter one, um, the description of botany as a science. So botany is the study of plants. And we do this through the scientific method. 
um, plants and as well as anything in science is studied through um, through this method through this process and it starts with observation a scientist will make an observation of things happening in nature um, or in a laboratory setting develop a hypothesis about it and a hypothesis is a guess or an ex tentative explanation for what's happening the reason behind it so we might notice that oh the leaves are changing color it's fall um, we see that and then a good scientist would form an explanation not just the question why but a hypothesis would be an explanation so the leaves are changing color because it's getting colder okay and then a scientist would experiment on that so a fun way to experiment something like that would be to set up greenhouses where we have let's say maple trees they're a common tree in new england and it's something a tree that has foliage that changes color in the fall we could set up one greenhouse where we keep the temperature warm summer temps and then we could set up another greenhouse that has cooler temps and have our maple trees in there treat them exactly the same except for the temperature so we can look at the results and if there's a difference in the results, we can draw a conclusion from that. So we might see that the colder temperature greenhouse, the leaves changed colors, the warm temperature greenhouse, they didn't. And if we can repeat that, do replicates of that experiment, uh, we could have a good conclusion there. Um, you'll see a link on Moodle about leaves changing color, and I encourage you to check that out because that's a phenomenon that happens around us. It's a big, big deal in the fall. We get tourism in New England for leaf color. So it's good to know why that happens. So when we do go through the scientific method like this, it's important to be replicable. That means that our experiment can be repeated by different scientists. And when scientists do that and get a good body of data, we look for our results, we look for our data. What were the results? This can lead to a theory. A scientific theory is what happens beyond one experiment. It's when scientists bring together multiple experiments, they look at the results, they can see that they are related and they can form a theory about it. We have the theory of evolution. We've, it's not just an idea. A lot of people use the word theory and hypothesis interchangeably, but a theory is something that has gone through all the steps of the scientific method many, many times and is strongly, strongly supported. Um, so eventually, a scientific law can be formed if it's applicable. And a scientific law is something that never changes. And we have very few scientific laws in biology and botany because there's so much diversity and so many different things that happen in the biological world. We see more scientific laws in physics and chemistry where there's less variability in subject matter. So laws are like the law of gravity, the law of inertia. So we don't see those too much in botany, but we will see um, some laws play out when we get to genetics because there's some probability there that is not going to change, even though um, the results of experiments can change, the probability will be the same. We'll also look um, during this semester at different parts of plant biology. Uh, section 1.4 in your textbook discusses the diversification of plant study. And that's just to say that there are many different parts to studying botany. And there are scientists who focus on each of these. There are people who study plant anatomy, and that is the structure and the physical formations of plants. So how many petals does a flower have? How many leaves? What is the leaf shape? Um, plant anatomy is one of the most concrete parts of botany, and it's a really fun one to look at. Um, plant physiology involves the functions and processes of a plant, even down to the cellular level. So it's how things work within a plant. How does photosynthesis happen? What are the metabolic processes that allow for the formation of plant waxes? So physiology is more function-based. Taxonomy um, and systematics are related. Taxonomy is the naming and classifying of organisms, of plants. So how do we name plants? Um, 
there are genus and species, as you probably know, and we're going to talk about that soon. Um, and how do they fit into other levels of classification? That ties into plant systematics, the grouping, which is related to the names. Names often reflect what group the plant is in. And then we have plant ecology, uh, plants in the environment, how plants interact with their environment and other organisms. So plant ecology can be looking at plants interacting in the wild, plants in an agricultural setting, plants even in a greenhouse. It could be plants in soil, plants with each other, plants in insects and animals plants with gas exchange. So that's a really broad topic of study with plant biology. When I was in graduate school, I studied plant pathology and uh, botany and plant pathology. And that is the study of plants and how they interact with diseases. So as a pathologist, I was looking at how plants react to different fungal infections, what happens with um, downy mildew and powdery mildew and how do we test for these different types of plant diseases. I was also looking at different types of fungi that live inside of plants that don't cause disease. Those are um, plant endophytes and that was a lot of fun. It ties together a little bit of ecology, a little bit of physiology, um, but it's called plant pathology, it's plant diseases. Right, so chapter one is fairly short. It's a broad, broad overview, just highlighting some of the topics, and I hope it gets you excited about studying botany. Um, we're going to look at diversity and classification of plants now. Um, my lectures, as you're going to see, are about in 15 minute chunks. I record them on a program called Screencast-O-Matic. It's a little behind the scenes, and that allows me to do 15 minute videos. Uh, but I found that 15 minutes is a good amount of time for a student to watch like one video. And so you can watch a 15 minute video, take a break, watch another one. The links will be separate on the Moodle page. Um, if it's something that you feel very comfortable with or you're reviewing, you could always watch the videos on two times speed if you want. So diversity and classification. Biodiversity is includes all the different species that we have, but also all the different genes that there are in species. Um, and we classify organisms by putting them into groups based on their similarities. So these two ideas are tied together. I often like to think of diversity and unity in biology um, as a broad idea that really just gets me excited. There's so much diversity in the living world, millions of species, but we all have certain things in common. So even though we're all different, we're all the same in some ways. And I'm talking humans, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, we're all different. Even every single organism of a species, like I'm different than my husband, but we do have a lot in common. We both have arms and legs and we both eat bread. So we can do those things. Um, so I say those, um, examples because we often think of diversity as how things look, but it's also about metabolism and the physiology of what's going on. So here's a beautiful field of flowers. It's actually not a very diverse field. If we get right down to it, there are daffodils, those yellow ones, tulips, the pink ones, some hyacinths. These are spring flowers, but they are all flowers and not all plants are flowering plants. So we'll see that as we go. Classically, historically, there were two basic kinds of life that were identified. Um, this was hundreds of years ago. Organisms were put in either the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. Uh, but we have found that there's a bit more to it than that. They thought animals move and eat other things. Plants are sessile. They stay in one place and produce their own food. But even in ancient times, people recognized that not all living things fit neatly into this two kingdom system, like these coral mushrooms. Where do they go? So that's something to think about, and I will see you in the next video.